Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the State of the Ark podcast. It feels so good to be back in here, doing it the way we intended, in the studio, <laughs> sitting next to each other. Yes. Um, it's been a crazy, crazy couple of months. We hope that everybody watching is safe and healthy. Um, and man, navigating through these times is is crazy. It's tough. So. Yeah. <sighs> Hopefully, today we can sit down and have a conversation that will be a nice, entertaining, enlightening uh, little escape from all the negativity that, that we're seeing on TV and the news and everything. So, mm -hmm. um, let's, get, let's get to it. We're going to be talking about three topics today. Um, we'll start out, Kaysen's working on a video. Yeah. And uh, and he, I need your help. He needs some input <laughs> yes. from the audience. And that's that's kind of what we want the podcast yeah. to be to some degree is to, <clears throat> you know, uh, get out some of the ideas that we're thinking about, refine those through good feedback, constructive criticism, and then the videos will be much better for it. So we're going to start there. Um, I am very close to finishing my review, my retrospective on Lost Odyssey. Um, and so this was actually something I wanted to talk about last week or maybe the week before, you know, anytime we could have met up for the podcast before, but it's just like circumstances didn't allow it. I know. It's all recorded now and I'm... Oh, nice. <laughs> so I'm not taking it back. <laughs> it's going in no matter what, but it'll still be fun to talk about it. Sure, I think yeah. a little bit more in depth than what I'm going to do in the review. So um, we'll be talking about eternal life, the, the concept of immortality, what that would actually be like and whether or not... Uh, whether or not a person could actually stand it, whether or not it becomes life right. becomes a prison for a person after a certain point in time, um, and the way that Lost Odyssey explores that, and you know, we'll get into that a bit more. And then, lastly, um, a really good uh, topic from Jonah the Man, Patreon supporter, uh, who sent us um, a legitimate essay on some gripes he has about time travel in uh, in storytelling and when it works and when it doesn't work pertaining to some of the feelings about the Final Fantasy VII Remake. Speaking of that, I've talked for five-ish hours on this podcast in the last couple months about Final Fantasy VII Remake. Do you have anything you want to say about it um, at, this, at this juncture? At this juncture, I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, I have some general thoughts. We talked about them on the demo, though. That's uh, true. A few, a few uh, you haven't, months ago. You played the demo, but you haven't played I the played game I played the yet. demo. I never played the game. And I never thought that I wouldn't care to play the game. But um, I don't. <laughs> That's that <laughs> so. interesting. In okay. Well, I will play it eventually. I really will. I just don't know when. And I don't know. Somehow it, uh, it's just not something that feels as uh, urgent to me. Pressing. Yeah. It's fair. Mm. All right, so the video that you're working on. Yeah. Um, tell us about it. What, what so, is, what's going on? Uh, the, the, the idea of it, and this is something that a lot of people have talked about for a long time, um, well, for a few months now, but the idea being uh, because of this COVID-19 issue and everything around it and the way society is kind of changing because of it, this is before recent events. <laughs> this idea, you know, because a lot of people, maybe it's not as important now, but it's still going to be a big issue for the next long time. And the way that it impacts gaming is going to uh, accelerate the process. What would have taken five or 10 years to happen is now gonna happen within just one year. Mm. And I, f I feel like that's just kind of happening all around, but within gaming, you see things like E3 being canceled and the Tokyo Game Show being canceled. And basically every gaming convention is just like, is done for the whole year. And well, like what that means for gaming in general because what happens you can you can take one year off of something but the ps5 is coming out this year right yeah. sony think, is going to I think their next event is to thursday oh dang where they're going to reveal the ps5 i mean i think we already Un know. totally <laughs> unveil it show <laughs> yeah. you the console yeah, what yeah. games are going to be at launch that kind of thing is it going to be like a four stack like <laughs> <laughs> i don't know man like i don't know what PS. it's going to look like <laughs> <laughs> so yeah oh no it'd have to be five huh anyways five. So um, they're going to have to do something that's not at a convention, which I don't think they wanted to do. I think this was supposed to be an E3 thing. Uh, but luckily for Sony, the past few years, they've been taking a page out of Nintendo's playbook and doing these direct uh, mm. state of play 
kind of videos direct to consumers as opposed to having to go through the journalists or the conventions or any of that other stuff. So we're seeing an acceleration in, in that, I think. Nintendo got a head start. Sony, this isn't the first time doing it, although I don't enjoy their state of plays nearly as much. Um, and then Microsoft is going to have to figure something out as well. So we're looking at a one-year gap from E3 that in which uh, these companies are going to learn, as Nintendo learned, how great it is to not do a live presentation where the, the teleprompter doesn't always go, where the, you have to wait five seconds before the crowd realizes they're supposed to clap, or you know, mm. where it just gets really awkward. Um, and then they can just kind of pre-record this stuff. Right. And they can do it however they want. They can show whatever they want. They don't have to do any live stuff where the motion controls don't work. So there's all sorts of reasons why Nintendo made the move. But now everyone is forced to make the move. Yeah. And they were all going to do it eventually. The state of play was slowly ramping up to become a thing that, you know, for the PS5, that was going to be a big reveal for something huge. And um, E3 taking just one year off is going to take many years uh, off of the life of the convention and how long it's going to last. And I, I, I could see E3 coming back next year because people make money off of it. People like to go and just play the new games or whatever. But the core purpose of E3 as the place where everything happens is uh, I, think it's, I think it's not going to be that way anymore. Well, I think it's an interesting premise because, mm. I mean, I, I think the, the idea of it being accelerated due to this is yeah. something to consider because, it, like you're saying, it was already going that way. It right? was, clearly. The, the purpose yeah. of conventions, let's say back in the 90s or something, <laughs> yeah. is that you're going to go to a large audience. Yeah. The largest you can, a big gathering. And specifically journalists. Yeah. Because the only way you can get your word out is if people write articles about your right. convention. You know, nobody yeah. could watch it live the way they can now. Right. And that is the only way anyone could actually get hands-on with a yeah. demo, for instance. Yes, yeah, yeah. In today's day and age, that isn't the case. You can yeah. send a demo to everyone yeah. who has just a PlayStation <laughs> and, the and, just, and an internet, and the internet yeah. and they can try it out and if you it. want to. If you want, yeah. Or you can do a closed beta or whatever it is that you're looking for. Mm. You can send demos out without having to have a convention be the place where people gather yeah. and try it out and wait in line. And then, is this good? Like the Famitsu score, what, 33 out of 40 or whatever they yeah. do. Um, you now just look at the reviews on the PlayStation Store. So, right. you know, how, how, how have people reviewed, or just wherever you're at, just going on the internet or Google or Metacritic, people can review this stuff immediately without the need for these big, um, these big like, uh, well, what, gaming like, publications to come out and tell you if it, the game's good or not. Yeah, and a lot of it is, I think, maintained because of legacy. Like mm. E3 is a, it's a legacy event. It is, yeah. You know? It's like a prestige thing. It's, it's like, like I went to E3. There's almost a habit installed yeah. in really hardcore players. Like yeah. E3 is coming. This is where, mm -hmm. I'm, but it's just because if that's it's not the at tradition. E3, it's not important, right? Right. That's like the, the, it's thinking. just the tradition yes. that you just know and I'm going to learn more there. And you almost th you almost need an excuse to to end those traditions. Yeah. It's almost like you need a reason. Like a lot of these companies may not have wanted to do this. I'm not, I don't know, maybe they loved it, maybe they didn't, I don't know. But I'm just saying that if you wanted to switch from these big conventions and in people's minds have a switch happen where it's like, oh, th it doesn't need to be this way, mm. then this is the time to do it. Yeah. And so uh, if, if nothing else, COVID-19 provides the excuse, it provides the video game industry the excuse to do things that would have taken 10 years for other people to see as palatable otherwise, yeah. including something like Google Stadia. Stadia. Stadia? Stadia? I think it's Stadia. Stadia? Yeah. So this has been kind of a joke on, on Twitter, but if Google Stadia was any good, this would have been the time where it would have completely taken off and people would have yeah. like been all in. This is the Netflix of gaming and because Netflix is doing great right now. Yeah. Um, but Google Stadia isn't, what, isn't quite it's, ready for it's this. Not <laughs> it's not ready for the prime time, right? Yeah. But it, you can see that that's where things are trending. You can just stay home and download a game and play the game all in one little thing and you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. It's a subscription. You have to pay more per game. You just have... It and you just play it and you're at home. I mean, it makes perfect sense. It just needed something like COVID-19 for people to kind of look at and see the value of like, oh, I don't want to go to the game store. And I'm playing a lot of games now. It starts to get really expensive yeah. the more games that you're playing. 
And just like a lot of uh, movies would skip Netflix, you know, for their own reasons, like a lot of yeah. Disney stuff, um, most video games didn't don't want to be on Google Stadia. But movies are starting to be streamed on Netflix. Like, yeah. in fact, there was this new Warner Brothers movie that I think was streamed on Disney Plus. I can't remember. Trolls, Trolls 2, the new oh, Troll movie. Right. Mm -hmm. And it did so well that WB is saying, hey, we might stream skip. a lot more movies mm -hmm. and skip the theaters completely. It, that, that's and actually COVID-19 gave them the excuse to do that. Whereas there's the Academy, there's all sorts of other pressures and the theaters said, oh, we're not, we're no more WB movies anymore. We're not showing any of your movies, even if you want us to, which yeah. is like, hey, well, you're part of the crowd that's going out. Yeah. WB is playing it smart and COVID-19 gave them the excuse that nobody can look at and blame them for to move in this new direction. Yeah. You know? now, there's a lot of industries where I think this, this is true of them as well. I mean, just a lot of um, mm. employees who have been able to work just fine from home and have yeah. not needed to come into an office. You can work mm. out of the office. It's totally possible, and this has yeah. proved that we have the capability to do yes. this. It's just that there was pressure, tradition, Right, uh, you got to have control, the big office you know? building. You got to have the fountain in the lobby. You've got to have this big presence, and it's like, well, your business runs pretty well. Okay, not every business, not every. It's business. It's not every business, but but many of the tech centered are, businesses run quite they, well without spending a hundred million dollars on a big well, office. Well, and like um, a lot of times, you know, you, you don't you don't even necessarily need to move into the region where the headquarters or the the office right. of business is. Yeah, you could yeah. hire from out of state, and this yep. this would open. So yeah, you don't have to live in Silicon Valley, which by the way is freaking expensive. Yeah. why live in San Francisco? No, or you don't have to. When you yeah. could live in the Midwest or somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, you know, lower cost of living because you don't have to go and in the office because do, it doesn't actually require it. The same like task, yeah. all of these types of things, I think we're going to see yeah. accelerated yeah. changes that should have been happening were maybe slowly happening, mm -hmm. but now it's like, well, yeah. it's just going to happen. It way just has to that. happen, and it's inevitable. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's no two ways about it. As Bill yeah. Baggins would, or Sam <laughs> Gamgee, who, who said that? <laughs> Maybe neither of them. <laughs> um, but so yeah, so that's essentially the premise of my video. And things are changing, and this is going to accelerate the change. And even though I, Mike brought this up, because I was like, everyone's just going to order video games from Amazon or download them themselves. Now, downloading, great, but the Switch has very limited capacity for that mm. at the moment. Whereas ordering on Amazon, apparently, and I, I wasn't completely aware of this, but it's been, there's yeah, been a lot of delays, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not permanent. That's not going to happen forever. Amazon's going to figure things out. The supply chain issues are going to be fixed. Amazon's going to go back to delivering things on time pretty soon. And then that's going to be a better place to buy your games than, for example, GameStop, yeah. where you have to actually walk into a physical store. You just don't have to do that anymore. And COVID-19 gives people the excuse to not do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Um, especially to see where just conventions, how yeah. they pick up the pieces from this, or how they change or have to like innovate mm -hmm. <laughs> in order to like sort of keep up, you know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what that looks like, but... Because online streaming, it's just not the same without a live audience, but maybe, well, I mean, the Nintendo Directs are, are, are fine. Just just, do, you just uh, have to rethink what a presentation is, you know, just, what a convention is. Just do what the NBA is going to do and have 2K crowd noise over the speakers. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's, what they're, that's what they're considering I doing. I didn't know that. So they're going to start the season up again So okay, um, in Orlando, I and they're going to yeah. keep everybody in this like bubble campus where they can't leave. Yeah. And let, until their team is eliminated or whatever, right? Yeah. And they're gonna play an empty arena, uh, in an empty arena, but they're gonna like simulate crowd noise to try to like give one team the feel that they have home court advantage or something. Oh it's really silly. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, what? this kind of reminds me of laugh tracks in the yeah. 90s sitcoms. Yes. Every show had a laugh track and they're kind of on, they're on the way out now. They're, mm -hmm. they're, most shows don't do that, a few might. Still do a that. lot of For like most part they sort don't. of prime time like big sitcoms or, something. or big. Do they still do that? I, that I actually, do. I was just watching because it was in yeah. Joan of the Band's thing. Oh he yeah, he showed a scene from Big Bang to like eliminate or to illuminate the point, mm -hmm. and it, there's the laugh trap again. I, I remember thinking like that is so weird it's just 90s. that that used to be common. Yeah, and like yeah. you don't see everyone it used anymore. to do that, and yeah. it's it feels so strange. Now. I think like arena noise and oh, it's as if it's being done live. People, um, right? That is, I think that may be where the NBA is at now, where it'll slowly start fading out. You don't need that, especially yeah. if everyone knows it's fake. Like, what's the point? Yeah, 
You know, it's kind of like I'm seeing, I'm, I don't know, I'm just seeing the way things are going out now. And it's like, especially with sports, I don't think theaters are going away. I don't think sports arenas are going away. You don't think theaters will go away? No. Like movie theaters? No, I, they will eventually. And this is one of aren't the... They, aren't they struggling really they bad are. right now? Like, They're not they doing well. are closing a bunch of them? And specifically right now yeah. because of the, um, you know, the situation. But um, I don't see them disappearing yet. I don't think this is the thing that makes them disappear. I think there's still too much clout. There's too much. It's the it's just the standard go-to date thing. It, there's too much to the, Hollywood has a, a lot of legacy power. or tradition. Yeah, there's too much there because people are talking about drive-through movies coming back, drive-in theaters and yeah. stuff. And I'm like, uh, that just limited capacity. You can only fit so many cars yeah. in one place, you know. So I think that people, I think the movie theaters are coming back, um, but they have what is it? A short lifespan. They, yeah. They're on a short leash, and I, they can't take too many more hits before. I see that they one as being a lot more volatile than like a live yeah. sporting event or a concert or something like that, right? Like, they were already struggling. Yeah, because some, of, in some cities you'll lose because your of theaters. the um, yeah. because of the well, surgence Disney... of streaming. Oh sure, yeah, right. Yeah. Like you can watch a movie from home. We have these immaculate large screen. Displays that yes. are OLED or whatever that are yes. becoming cheaper and cheaper with time that are like mm. the picture here is Just as good if not better than at the movie theater. I don't right. have to go sit bench to uh, next to a bunch of people I don't know who might ruin my experience <laughs> yeah. and uh, o- Overpay for popcorn, right? So like that I could see Going away much more quickly. Yeah, than like so sporting events if theaters had 15 years left to live <laughs> Maybe they have 10 years left now, but I don't see it quite being the next year kind of thing. The way we're, we're going to see a lot of gaming changes within the next year, I don't see that exact same thing with theaters, although many, especially in small towns, and you know, maybe you live in a big city with 20 theaters, maybe you're only going to have 16 now, but I don't see that going away the, quite as quickly yet. Yeah, I think there will be probably a big push from yeah. Hollywood types, traditional filmmakers, people like... Um, Christopher Nolan, who still shoots yes, on film. Yes, he still shoots on film. And <laughs> Wally Pfister. And, and yeah. refuses yeah. to shoot digital ever. Like, yeah. see the benefit to it, you know. I think there are a lot of those types still that'll probably try to keep it alive for whatever They will. And time, it's, it is, it's just fun to go out and watch a movie, just like it's fun to go out and watch sports. Uh, you, you, I, don't, I just don't see those leaving yet, the yeah. way that I maybe did a few months ago. Mm. Well, we'll see. Yep. Interesting stuff. So, if you have any comments or thoughts on that, let Kaysen know. So yes, please talk to me about this. And video. especially your, like, do you see yourself downloading and ordering online, or are you guys still going to the brick-and-mortar retail stores to buy your video games? Uh, and did this not change much? And now that you've had the convenience of just ordering it and downloading it, even though I'm sure you guys have been doing that for years, um, do you see yourself going back for those people who used to go into the Best Buy or to the GameStop to buy your games? Do you see yourself doing that in 2021? Mm. There you go. Like lining up outside the store. For the most part, I don't do that. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I've bought a game from a store in quite a long time. And part of it is mm. my backlog is huge, so even if it's going to come <laughs> late, right. I almost don't it's care like, about fine. playing it day one anyways. Mm. I don't know. Like The yeah. novelty of playing the game the day it comes out isn't the same for me anymore as it was when yeah. I was younger. And I think that's just because there's so many like, there didn't used to be this many game releases. I know, game it's freaking it, insane. It, it felt like you a know once what? or twice a year thing. I was going to get hyped for a game. It's, it's going to get, there's going to be even more. Because the gaming industry is doing pretty well right now. Yeah. And we're going to see, like, people, it's an industry where you can work from home. Not perfectly, but, you know, 90% efficiency sure. probably. 80. And uh, you can, like, people are still consuming your product like crazy. It doesn't matter that unemployment's at, like, 15%. People are still buying your product. Yeah. And you don't need to rely on the retail stores. Uh, it's the industry that people are going to start transitioning into who have lost their jobs or who are looking for work. It's like, well, video games. And that it's going to get bigger. It's going to get even bigger, especially with Google Stadia and everything. So. All right. Okay, so... Um I've been trying to think about how I want to frame this next <laughs> topic because it's, I've talked about it a lot on the Patreon streams uh, for, for those of you who are uh, you know, at the level where I do the streams you know, regularly. Um, I've just finished playing, just finished. Like a month ago I finished playing Lost Odyssey and I've been mm. structuring my retrospective, my review since then. And, and one of the things 
that we've even talked about, I think, in the past on the podcast, that is interesting yeah, about the game's premise is the, how it portrays the life of an immortal being mm. and like the burden that that becomes on them over time, right? right. So they have these um, little dream sequences called the thousand years of dreams that you unlock by talking yeah, to certain remember, NPCs yeah. or interacting with the environment. Like he'll be sort of like, um, like a, he'll be awakened. He, yeah. He's because it's a JRPG. He's an amnesiac. He can't remember because yeah. <laughs> that's every. GRPG ever. <laughs> he can't remember his past. Protagonist does not yeah, remember yeah. the past, right? It's total trope. Right. But it's interesting in this game because, um, well, anyways, I won't spoil it, but you, are, you, you, you interact with things and these memories are sort of sparked, right? Yeah. About his, his thousand years of life that he's lived so far. Things that he should not have forgotten. Shouldn't have it, forgotten. It, it, according yeah. to the way that you would think that, yeah. that you know, living a thousand years would go. Yeah. So, anyways... Um, they're really beautiful. They're written by hmm. um, a very popular um, and, and a best-selling novelist in Japan. Um, forget the, the first name. I'm, Shigematsu is his last oh. name. I can't remember the first name for some reason. Anyways, People very, very watched the video. I, uh, <laughs> Japanese names are hard for me to remember. It's not my mother tongue. Right. Anyways, um, they're really, really well written. And one thing I learned through mm. my, um, my research is that they actually went to Jay Rubin, who is apparently like a, a world-renowned Japanese literary translator. Like mm. works. Oh, to put it in English? Yeah, he translated <coughs> those. Wow. Which is like super out of the ordinary for mm. the game industry. They, they like went to him and he was like, what are you talking to me for? I don't want anything to do with video <laughs> games because his, his perception, it's yes, all sure. violence and blood and guts and right. perpetuation of... And so he was like totally against it, but then he read a couple of the, the samples and he's like, this is actually the total opposite message. Mm. And this is actually really wholesome and I'm, I'm gonna work on this. So anyways. That's cool. So you have uh, an, an amazing author and a, a world renowned translator, <laughs> mm. literary translator who worked on that side of it. And so it's unsurprising to me that the result is those are really good. Yeah. <laughs> Those little short stories are actually really, really freaking good. Um, my problem with the game storytelling came more on the on the the, the main plot side of things. Mm. And I'm going to put just I'm going to put a spoiler spoiler warning up now, not because I'm going to like reveal something huge or any like major. Mm -hmm gigantic plot point or something. But rather because I'm afraid that even the little things in today's <laughs> spoiler culture, <laughs> spoiler sensitive yeah. culture just trigger people and say, ah, why'd right. you say that? So if you don't know anything about Lost Odyssey's story, like skip this topic or something. Okay, three, two, one, here we go. Now I'm talking <laughs> freely about it. So the, the premise that is explored and, and you read it in the like Uematsu quotes and Sakaguchi quotes, they were really focused on creating this deeply emotional experience and, and thinking about if you could live forever, mm. but everyone else around you has a normal lifespan, right? Uh, uh, all these lifetimes worth of meeting new people, losing people, yeah. settling down and maybe starting a family here and then you just, you lose everything over yeah. and over and over again. Like at what point does that become such a burden, such a, uh, just a repetitive mm -hmm. experience that life itself just, it becomes a prison to you. Like mm -hmm. you don't actually want to continue living anymore. I, had a, I actually had a thought about this being that like, like great grandchildren, Yeah. How, I don't know, I'm not that close. Well, my great grandmother passed away like two years ago, but she was like 103. I. I saw her maybe like four or five times in my life, right? Yeah. The the more generations that go down, like you have your family, you live forever, they all die. How close are you even to your great grandkids? Yeah. As they become your age or your, you know, are you even going to be friends with them? Are you even going to see them? Are they going to care that you're their great grandfather? Yeah. And then great, great, it just keeps going down from there. It keeps getting more distant. And it's like, well, you, you, you don't have anyone that you're close to anymore mm -hmm. because it's too it's too distant and there's too many of them. By the time you get down to like five generations away, you've got like a hundred 
great grand great yeah. great 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 grandkids and it's like okay they're i don't even know their names you know it's like you end up just like you you have to let go because you're still there and they're all moving on with their lives you know right i've thought about that um pretty recently actually yeah i mean and the large caveat you know to this entire exploration of eternal life is the fact that you get to live forever, everyone else doesn't. Yes. Right, so that's the one difference between, well, so it's what if like, everyone got to yeah, live yeah. forever? It would probably oh, be a great. different thing. Yeah, yeah, like the elves in Lord I, of the Rings. I yeah, still don't think it would be entirely different. And oh, that's, yeah. the, that's the one thing I'm going to jump into. Mm-hmm. It, on, on top of the fact that it would be really painful and you'd start to get really lonely, which is what right. you're driving at, right? The loneliness of like not feeling like you can connect with anyone because... You're, you're just going to lose them again. Right. And you're just going to lose them again. So why care? Yeah. Like, why, why get into a new relationship? Right. Why start a new family? Mm-hmm. I've done this five, six times. It's, it sucks when you get that attached. You love someone so much. I'm, like, I, I'm not a father. You are. Right. The thought oh, yeah, of yeah, that yeah, child that's... growing up, dying, but you have to keep going and yeah, then doing that again and not... again and again. Well, it's it, it, what, um, in The Two Towers, this is what uh, Bernard Hill, what's his name, Theoden, says no no father should have to bury their child right yeah. but you're talking about a life where that's all you do forever forever you you are always the one that that buries your children yeah. like maybe at some point you stop wanting to do that stop wanting to do that yeah. altogether <laughs> just I would. give up on that i would right yeah. i i would think i think that that feels pretty intuitively true to mm-hmm. me like so I anyways so. Yeah. within that framework these short stories do a really good job of examining that all these points in his life when like just tragedy after tragedy after tragedy he just becomes more and more like apathetic to it all and just you know there, there, there's one really good story where he's working as a mercenary at the time and by the way this is not lord of the rings type of mortality where you can be killed but you just right. live forever he actually cannot be he physically cannot be killed, killed. that's right he you find that at, at the beginning yeah yeah like you could freaking you get Slight, nuked. Yeah, he, he's not going <laughs> to die. <laughs> and you're not going to die, yeah. Yeah, that's so, true. So it's a little different in that sense, too, yeah. but he's working as a mercenary, and there's some young guy uh, who's, like, freaking out, losing it, like, oh, panicking. And he helps this person to defect from the battlefield. It's like, get mm-hmm. out of here. Like, you're not ready for this. And he, he specifically sort of, like, thinks about the fact, or, or no, the, the, the kid asks him, like, why don't you run away with me? Don't you want to live? Aren't you afraid to die? Mm-hmm. Like, don't you want to? He's like, no, I don't have any particular will to live anymore. Like, your like burden he, yeah. of life is so fragile still, and mine is not the same because I i don't want to be alive anymore. Mm-hmm. I have to be alive now, right? right? Okay, so that's sort of like the groundwork, the framework that they work in. And it's really interesting. It's explored in really nuanced ways in those little short stories. And the main plot, I felt like really failed to address that thematic question in Mm. any way. Not even just like, oh, they alluded to it somewhat. It it feels like it's not there at all. And in the end, Hmm. a lot of these immortal characters, they choose to stay in the mortal realm for another millennium cycle. Mm. And I'm sitting there feeling like such a disconnect. <laughs> like, Because hmm. I- if their theory about humanity is true, that humans aren't built for this, we can't do this, Yeah. then why, why are people stay? deciding to do it? Yeah. One of the immortal characters falls in love with one of the mortal characters in the party. Okay, that's good. You're going to live with 30, that person for this amount years. of time and they yeah. die and then what? Yeah. And uh, the main characters, hmm. this one I understand a little bit more, right? So... They had a daughter who, okay, so their grandchildren, let's put it that way. Mm. Their grandchildren are young, so, and, the, and the mother is gone. So there might be some, I would think there would probably be a strong draw to be like, well, we're responsible for the care yes. of these people once they become of age to yeah. take care of themselves. Well, what about their kids? But then <laughs> another thousand years? I mean, you're going to keep going? When, when all of yeah. these stories like laid out just how like miserable an existence this was? Now, hmm. the, the counterpoints that I've seen to this are uh, that I think are relevant are, well, 
an immortal life like that isn't only going to be filled with tragedy and sorrow and loss. I mean, like the bound, the, the other side of that is yeah. a lot of things will still be good, positive, n you know, new, fresh experiences. And that's true to an extent. And this is where I think we get into the second part of why immortality would suck. <laughs> <laughs> what? And that is that eventually you run out of ways to be challenged. Sure. Right? Um, one thing that I was thinking about today was like, what is it? Uh, boredom is almost the worst, <coughs> worst thing <coughs> in the universe, um, which is why like solitary confinement is almost the worst thing you can do. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <coughs> and it, along that vein, like that's a powerful. It's not an emotion. What is boredom? Is it an emotion? It <laughs> kind of it's is. It's a powerful I it being described motivation, I guess, for yeah. humans. It's 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 we want to avoid that at yeah. all costs. It sucks, yeah. right? Um, one one uh, analogy I heard, I don't know how true this is, but you know, like damnation being like like a dam halts the progress of water. Sure. It's, it's your progression being stopped, not being able to learn, progress, yeah. do something new. That is and it's an, it's damning for that to happen. Horrific yeah. fate. <laughs> yeah, that is right. Yeah, yeah. So we've touched on this a little bit in previous podcasts too, but. The longer you live, the less <clears throat> exists of fresh new experiences, something yeah. you haven't seen before, something you haven't tried, something mm -hmm. you haven't done. And in the course of a regular person's life, 80 to 100 years, there's no chance that you're gonna be able to do everything that right. you ever <clears throat> thought would be exciting. Mm -hmm. I picked up the guitar at the age of 12 and I played it pretty seriously for a couple of years mm -hmm. and then I got, interested in other stuff and I kind of stopped my learning, right? right? So let's say I'm just, I'm sick of video production. I'm, I'm sick of all yeah. the stuff that I'm doing right now. I'm gonna go dedicate my life, challenge myself mm -hmm. to become an amazing guitarist. That'd be a new challenge, a new change that would take me from the boredom and repetition of this career that I've done for a decade right, mm. at this point, that does start to feel fatiguing and right. like re repetitious and just like, ah, oh, I'm just doing the same thing every day. Right. And I'd be able to go take on a new challenge. And then as soon as that got boring, then there'd always be something yeah. else, it would seem. And you'd be like a, what is it, like a moderate expert in a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> or even like some people who dedicate their whole lives to one craft. I mean like, it, okay, so this mm. kind of plays into it, but I've been watching a lot of stand-up comedy like oh, at nice. night. Yeah. Um, I find it really interesting because I think it's illuminating for somebody who's really interested in breaking down and analyzing good storytelling because mm -hmm. there's a lot of similar principles there. Sure. They have a punchline, which is the equivalent to a story's climax, and they are telling you the story that gives you the relevant contextual information. Yeah, and the reveal of information lead, is yes. part of what makes it so, right. yeah. And the best comedians are the ones who are the best storytellers. Mm. They are the best at leading you into that punchline with all the stuff you need to know to maximize the effectiveness of that joke, right? Mm. And it's the same thing with like in a drama or, or an emotional climax for a story or a film or something like that. Everything that comes before that moment is the reason it works. Mm -hmm. The reason you feel that is because of all the stuff you've learned contextually about this character, about their life, about the world, about whatever. Mm led to that working, right? And so Dave Chappelle did a special. <laughs> I've seen some of his, um, his Where he stuff. talks about he's so good at comedy. He's probably the best. I, I, I would say he's, he's, probably he's the, the best. best comedian. It's a combination of everything. It's his face reactions, it's yeah. his voice. His voice just, you hear him say anything and it's funny. It's, the, it's everything about him is just so well done. Yeah, yeah. he's totally mastered yeah. the craft. And so he's talking in the special about I'm so good at this that mm. I have no doubt before I step on that stage that I'm gonna do well. <laughs> and how he yeah. writes jokes backwards. He'll write a punchline, a random punchline mm -hmm. on a piece of paper and put it into a fishbowl and he'll, and he'll just grab one out, out <laughs> and he'll be like, okay, that's the punchline, I have to get there somehow. Yeah. How am I gonna, he writes it backwards because wow. he's 
mastered it, and there's no there's no satisfaction. Mm. He has to impede himself. <laughs> yeah, that's right? true. That's true. By putting more rules and restrictions on, yeah. that's how you get more to satisfaction. To make it out of interesting, things. to yeah. challenge, to make the mind yeah. work. You know, right? that's kind of like how sports were made too, because you've got like basketball. Like, okay, put the ball in the hoop. All right, but that's just a little bit too easy. Let's yeah. put the hoop up 10 feet. Yeah. Okay, well that, okay, but now you have to dribble. Well, now you can't just run with the ball. You have to pass. Okay, now there's mm -hmm. five other people. So it's like you you get it bef until you find that point of optimal um, like friction where it's not, where it's like really hard, but people can still do it. Yeah. And that's where you find an actual sport that works. Yeah. It's one of my um, gripes with Quidditch. It doesn't work. <laughs> But anyways, uh, uh, J.K. Rowling didn't think this through. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's great. It's an interesting sport, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work in terms of that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so anyways, um, in order to continue finding any like satisfaction or, or growth or progression as a comedian, he ha he's had to start creating artificial challenge for himself. Mm. You see people who have played a game a hundred times doing things like yes. that. Let's, let's instill yeah, a randomizer yeah. into the game. Yeah, let's, yeah. Um, pl I'm going to do a soul level one run of Dark right. Souls where I don't level up at all. Yeah, I'm going to do it with insane. no armor. I'm going to, you know, they impede themselves yeah. to try and make the playthrough interesting because just mm. doing it the regular way is boring now, right? right. The more you repeat something, mm. the less interesting it is. And the more you live, the more everything is repeated right. and you've seen it before. And so, there was, and, and the thing I was going to say about this is like the reason I've been watching a lot of stand-up comedy, uh, aside from finding it interesting to analyze, is I'm kind of tired of playing video games right now. <laughs> like, I, I just, I'm not feeling it. I don't mm. feel drawn to like play a lot of games anymore. Um, it's becoming repetitious and boring to me. Uh, I, I feel it a little bit in uh, the retrospectives that I do. There's a formula. I, I know for a fact I have not one ounce of of hesitation or reservation whatsoever mm -hmm. that that video is going to do really well. Nice. Good work. People are going to like it. It's going to yeah. get a bunch of views. Right. Because I... Because you've been doing this for 10 years. I've been doing it for 10 years and <laughs> yeah. I've refined the formula. Yeah. I know exactly what to say here. You know what? Here, we were just... We here. just did the math on the way over here actually of what does it take to get 10,000 hours yeah. of a full-time job of whatever you do. And mm -hmm. I think it was, it's like five years, right? Yeah. Five years working so eight 40, hours a day. Yeah, and then, yeah, so it's about five years working eight hours a day, and you basically, so you've done that twice now. <laughs> yeah, something, <laughs> For whatever something job you like that, yeah. right? Like, I probably haven't put eight hours a day. My math might be wrong. The please. equivalent of eight hours a day maybe has not been spent on retrospective creation, so maybe not five, but oh, maybe not more exactly. like seven, eight but in still, that range. Yeah. I'm not completely positive, but confident that I'm approaching that level. <laughs> so you say, I'm 99% sure, yeah. I'm almost there in terms of just video production yeah. and, and this sort of thing. But I, I have a formula for these scripts. I know exactly what I'm gonna say here, here, and here. I know exactly what type of music and how yeah. to do the transition. Mm -hmm. And I know what this is gonna lead into this. And that's not to say that there's no thought put into it. There's always something that mm -hmm. comes up. And again, I've only been doing it for 10 years. I'm not saying I've done this for a thousand years, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm not completely sick yeah. of it yet to the point where I can't even like stomach the thought. Right. But there But that are, would happen eventually, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and I see it slowly happening already, yeah. which is I think what has led to this idea of let's, uh, Let's rebrand. Let's try to mm. expand a little bit more. Let's try to talk about something other than just JRPGs and video games. Like, right. this has already started to feel so boring to just talk about the same things. I felt like our podcast, when it was still Dark Pixel Gaming Podcast, mm. was, I was saying the same thing every week. It was often, yeah. <laughs> I was, I Especially was, around Final Fantasy <laughs> 15, where it was like, okay. I, every <laughs> single freaking episode, I was saying the same thing over and over. I was sick yeah. of hearing my own self-talk about uh -huh. this, right? It was like, <laughs> this is boring. Yeah, I gotcha. Now, you have viewers, new viewers coming in who haven't seen it before. And right. So like, you keep growing or whatever, but I was just getting so tired of it. So anyways, my point is, I was watching, I don't even think, I, I'm not the biggest fan of Jerry Seinfeld, and I'm gonna cut away for this, but I wanna show this clip to Case in here. Um, it, this summarizes really quite well, and in a way that I think is intuitive. I, I, I feel like this, will intuitively feel true to most people who hear it, right? But he talks about give it, getting older, being 65 years old, right? Hey, you wanna check out that flea market? 
the attitude, right, mm-hmm. towards checking out a flea market. How many times has a 70-year-old right. done that? Been there, done that. Right? And yeah. here comes the, my favorite part. I don't want to grow. I don't want to change. I don't want to improve at anything. I don't want to expand my interests, meet anyone, or learn anything I don't already know. <laughs> Jerry, check this out. You got to see this. This move. I, I don't like doing this anymore. I just don't want to do it. You got to say this. I disagree. <laughs> just seen a lot of things. There you go. I'll see it on the way back when it's in front of me. How about that? <laughs> or I won't see it. Or I'll Google it. Or I'll just assume it's probably a lot like something else I've already seen. <laughs> that wow. point. Yeah. Right? This, I mean, it, it, it used to be funny to watch my grandparents or old people have that kind of attitude towards life. Yes. And it felt so wrong to me. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, come on, you're just, you're just old, like, mm-hmm. like, you know, but I'd never thought of it in quite that way. It's just, I've seen it all so many times. It's right. so boring and repetitious and fatiguing. It just, life itself just becomes such a burden. I, I yeah. don't want to learn anything new. I don't want to try something. I'm, I'm done. Like, it's not mm-hmm. exciting anymore, right? That's not, the, again, the, the spectrum to which this will be true will depend on the individual and the type of life they've lived and personality and attitude toward life. Right. There's, as always, there's spectrum to things yeah. in life. For example, I think Donald Trump looks forward every day to <laughs> talking to the press, to tweeting on his Twitter, and I don't, I don't think that he, I don't think it gets old for him. I think he really enjoys it. And, you know, there's different types of people, but eventually... That would get old, right? Yeah. You'd and <laughs> now we multiply this by 10 mm-hmm. to 1,000 years. And yeah, then what yeah. about beyond the 1,000 years? Because maybe someone will make the argument, well, Kime in Lost Odyssey, he just realized maybe there is a spark of life he still enjoys and, mm-hmm. and that, you know, let's go another round of 1,000 years, another millennium, because he yeah. found that somewhere, but I didn't see him find that mm-hmm. in the game. Right? So you don't, yeah. They didn't address that. Instead, instead so they talk it, constantly about hmm. politics and, and this very cartoonish villain who's trying to like take over the world for reasons I won't talk about here. Mm-hmm. But it's just like you had this premise that is such an interesting thing and you yeah. did it so well in the short stories and then the game itself like just ignores that thematic question and almost gives the antithesis to that in its conclusion. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Anyways, what were you going to say? Well, it's almost like they did too good of a job with the premise. Yeah. They did such a good job that the story they wanted to tell actually didn't make sense anymore because they sold you too far on the premise and they uh, they got you into a point where you were agreeing with, well, you were agreeing with the premise. The, the cycle of life. <laughs> and so what, how do you end that when the premise is already yeah. the end of a thousand years sucking? You know. Yeah. It's like the cycle of life things coming to an end, these things are sad to think about. They're hard to Mm -hmm. wrestle with, right? Right. Because you're in the good times, you're like, I don't want this to ever end. But the truth is, is that if you live in that good time Mm -hmm. with no conflict, nothing challenging you, it is no longer good. It's boring. It's just status quo. It's just, okay, well, this again. More of The good times cannot last forever because it would eventually you would become a wash in it and it would just feel, like you said, status quo. Yeah. It's not exciting anymore. Mm. It's not interesting. It's not, it's not positive. It's just what it is. And so conflict, challenges, hard times, these are the things that make entertainment mm. interesting. You don't go to a movie and just watch a guy sitting on his porch in retirement every day <laughs> just thinking about like, ah, I finally get my chance to relax. No one wants to watch that. That's right. boring. And that's why a lot of people who do retire, let's talk about people who are very oh, ambitious, gosh. like CEOs, yeah. who maybe will go into retirement, and they can, they can only stand it for like six They months. come out of retirement pretty quick. It's yeah. like, I can't do it. I know. Uh, Reggie yep. Fisame. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Reggie. Retires from Nintendo of yeah. America, uh, vice president or president or whatever it was, and goes and joins the board of GameStop because mm-hmm. it was like a, a period of months. Right. Because... If there's no conflict, if there's nothing challenging you, if there's nothing happening that, that makes you feel like you're progressing as a person, what's the point mm. of being alive? It's so boring. And I think that in a true case of eternal life, 
however long that would have to be for each person on the spectrum of what mm. they find interesting. Yeah. However long that would be, let's say you lived for 20,000 years, do you think at some point you would have pretty much mastered anything that you find interesting at that point? I, be like, I, there would likely left? be nothing. Like for me, I'm super fascinated by languages, right? Yeah. I would speak every language on the planet by yeah. then, and then I'd, there'd be no more languages to speak. In fact, 20,000 years from now, if humans even exist, most of those language would most of those languages would be dead languages. Yeah. In fact, there may only be one language for all humans in 20,000 years. And yeah. it's like I just wasted a ton of time. Yeah. So like no matter what, things change and things um, I don't know, there's just like yeah, anything that you're interested in, you would have by far done by that. Yeah. That point in time. And so like if you like traveling, you'd have been everywhere. What else is there to do? Yeah. And, at, and, and at what point is it space. like, there's nothing left to do, so I'm more or less, not quite the same, but mm. it feels analogous in some ways to being in solitary confinement. That's what life is for you now. Right. Congrats. Doing the same <laughs> thing, which isn't really anything, just subsisting for the yeah. point of it. And sure, maybe you could come to the conclusion that 1,000 years isn't long enough to get to that point where it's like, I right. just don't want to be alive anymore at all. Maybe you can say, here's something for you, main characters of, of Lost Odyssey to hold on to and give you something to live mm -hmm. for. A thousand years is, isn't enough, we've decided, you know? Mm -hmm. But at some point that's gonna happen. At some yeah. point, death, ending, reaching a conclusion, moving on to a new chapter, whatever, is the inevitability. It is, and everyone will want or seek for that at some yeah. point, if they had that kind of longevity, right? And I, I really wish that the game had explored that a little more. Um, but I'm very interested to see what people in the audience think about that, mm. because <sighs> there's a lot of people who really love this game. It's, it's not like, it didn't sell super well, and not right, a lot I of people remember. have played it. It was exclusive yeah. to the Xbox 360, and RPG fans played, or JRPG fans, played the, the PlayStation, PlayStation yeah. right? They, they were loyal to the brand, and so a lot of people didn't play it, but it, it's pretty universally, reversely considered a really great game. Mm. But this particular thing about it, it, it didn't seem to work. It, 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 I didn't feel like its ending was earned. Hmm. Um, and I feel like they could have gone way further. Um, they could have had the characters actually talk to each other about their individual immortal experiences sure. and say, you know, I've had this and this and this experience. It's been all pretty much bad, and like I've done all this loss, and, and Kaim can be really pessimistic about it, but maybe Ming or someone else can be like, you know, like I, I, I would never take back all these experiences where I met all these great people, and, and even though, you know, I can't meet with them again, you know, the, even though I'm separated now, eternally from them, like uh, I would, st the adage, tis better to have loved and lost than mm -hmm. never to have loved at yeah. all kind yeah. of a thing, right? Yeah. And compounding on this is that in the immortals' previous experience, they couldn't feel emotions. So the human experience is very unique because it introduces emotion, which is, in, in the prism of life, it's almost like the reason that right. anything is worth doing is because of the emotions, stuff. the, yeah, the yeah. stuff that you feel yeah. about it, right? So anyways, that's more or less the case that I'm gonna make. I have an idea though, I have an idea. This, maybe I shouldn't say this out loud, actually. <laughs> there is possibly a reason why you would want to live for another thousand years. Okay. <laughs> eventually, if you're still alive, you're immortal, you could somehow, and eventually it would happen, you would work your way in to become the shadow government of whatever government you belong to. You're the shogunate, you're the one that is consistent while everything else changes, elections are meaningless, mm. you're executing your plan, you're still there, you're always you're, there. You're thinking like the villain. <laughs> yes, and after a thousand years, you can slowly, and this will be your project, because it'll take a thousand years, yeah. you can slowly craft a world government according to your like desires, how you want it to be, and you can make things happen and pull all the strings and make all the all the decisions using all the, everyone else as your puppet, and then you, because there has to be a centralized vision to any type of government that's gonna bring everyone together, right? So you, one immortal person who's alive for a thousand years who thinks that's their yeah. only purpose, because you would think, and I'm not saying, I, you know, th that's, that's obviously would have, they would end in mass bloodshed, guaranteed. But you know, maybe it would work. You're but, thinking like Angora from the game. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm thinking like the villain because 
because you, you slowly start doing bigger and bigger things. One of the things that I look at is, um, like what does Bill Gates do with $100 billion? Like at some point there, uh, there's a, uh, what do they call it? The marginal utility of wealth it basically vanishes. You, you can buy everything you want to buy except your government. Mm. And you have the money, just, just buy your government. That's the one thing you can't have, but that you could buy if you were smart well, enough. Well, think about Go the, ahead the, and buy the concept it. that we're talking about in relation to wealth now. Like, mm -hmm. you've accumulated so much of it, life experience that it's no longer, and these guys are very driven, red personality yeah, types yeah. that like need a challenge all the time, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they're all Eagle maniacal, or that they'll be, that they would yeah. be. But but it's an interesting point that what else can I do? Like where can I go? Right. How can I continue to go up? It's almost like it you becomes would, an obsession. You would inevitably be, become a villain. Yeah. In that world, you, you would you, have you, to you, become a villain. You what, live long enough to what? Like yes, die the um, hero, or Harvey Dent. You, you die the hero, or you live long enough to become the villain. Exactly. Or something like that. Because at some point, you're going to be like, there isn't much left to do, but. Maybe I can buy the government. <laughs> <laughs> That's the I ultimate don't challenge, right? I'm just saying, it's the one thing that you can't do, that you can't buy, that you shouldn't do, at least not in a democracy, but that, hey, I wonder if I could actually do this, and you definitely can't so, do that. So, again, philosophically, I think the framework <laughs> is there for, yeah. for that. I, I wish that they had pitted Gongora and Kaim against each other yeah. ph philosophically in that way, right? Mm. Kaim, Kaim saying, things need to end. Like, I have gone through this experience and realized this needs to be over. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to end in order for, like, it can't be satisfying. You'll be chasing it forever. Right. And you'll become less and less satisfied, more and more the villain. Right. right. And Gongora Until you is, literally own the world and then... Yeah. Gongora then is what? literally exhibiting that. Yeah. And, and Kaim is like, no, this is wrong. I'm taking you back mm -hmm. to our world. Like... I think that, if that had been the story of Lost Odyssey, would have been phenomenal, would have been mm -hmm. so congruent with the short stories and with the overall theme, and instead, it just <laughs> doesn't do that. Well, there you go. And that disappointed me a lot, and, and it, yeah. it, it took a, a, great, a great degree of enjoyment away from, from the game that mm -hmm. otherwise, I think, had an outstanding premise and a really good foundation gameplay wise like I really love how much of a Final Fantasy it feels like to play it does I remember that the yeah. story specifically and I didn't finish the game but I yeah. do um, I played it for a while actually and the the way that he has those memories the dreams the flashbacks yeah. the the way and the, the kind of like visual novel style mm -hmm. that things are done in yeah I found that absolutely fascinating yeah I can't remember why I didn't even finished it. I think it was a long game. <laughs> it's it's about sixty hours. Sixty. Yeah, it's no. it's uh, somehow it felt substantial. Maybe because of the what the visual novel aspect of it, it felt a bit longer to me because yeah. it wasn't as uh, actiony. Yeah, it was years ago that I played it, it. I mean, but it's got that formula, that FF classic formula. Yeah. Like it's this feels truer to Final Fantasy than anything post Final Fantasy X. Yeah by a hundred million light years. And I enjoyed that, like I, f I loved playing it. But like, man, I wish that they had really focused more of the story on that sort of philosophical question. But cool. anyways, would love to hear what other people have to say on that. Like I said, it would have been great to have discussed this a little earlier before I wrote the thing and <laughs> recorded it and I'm now in the middle of I was gonna come up a few weeks ago, but things have been uh, pretty difficult. I usually take public transport on the way up here, so. Um uh, I just didn't want to do that for the past three months. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a challenging time. There's, you know, certainly like take care of, of yourself and your family and everything mm -hmm. that takes precedence. But I've already said all this in the review. But it'll at least be interesting. You're good. It'll at least be interesting to see uh, what people's responses are to that. Get some different perspectives if they exist. Okay, last topic for today. This comes from Jonah the Man on Patreon, and he wrote. Um, I, I, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll kind of tease our viewers and say, you wrote me a tome, you wrote me an essay. In, a novel. In their, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> two or three paragraph. Uh, this is legitimately an essay yeah. on time travel in Final Fantasy and time travel in general in stories. Um, I can't, I have read the whole thing. I will not have time to do that now. But I'm going to sort of... You should, you should get this published somewhere. You should put this on medium.com or something like that. <laughs> if, if you're open to it, Jonah, um, 
you know, I can share the link to your Google document in like the description of the video so people can read it who are interested in doing that. Um, but that's up to you. So let me know what you mm. want to do and, and we'll see. I guess I could ask you not after the, the, the <laughs> by the time this is up. You'll already know. <laughs> I will have already asked you that in a private right. DM or whatever. Anyways, the thesis of what he's saying here is that times travel stories only work when the story isn't about time travel. Hmm. That time travel is a framework to create high, high stakes mm -hmm. and drama and um, to give maybe even like some form of limit you know, to, to the character. Put them in a predicament and, and create high stakes. If that's the purpose of time travel, it works. When you have to actually focus on it and make it make sense and you make the story about mm -hmm. time travel, a concept that we cannot wrap our heads around in real life, it all falls apart. So he talks about stories like Chrono Trigger or uh, the first Back to the Future. You know, when you think about those, they aren't really about time travel, right? right. That the story is not about the concept of time travel or mm -hmm. something like that. It's, you know, kind of a coming of age tale or um, a story about a person who's thrust into um, a world he's unfamiliar with and you know, coming to terms with you know, meeting his parents and that sort of thing, like there's a lot mm. more relatable themes that they sort of really focus on with that, right? Yeah. Um, and there was one thing he says here in particular that I wanna read. Cause he talks about Final Fantasy 13 2 and the Final Fantasy 7 remake. Mm -hmm. and um, the Terminator franchise yeah, being yeah. the opposite of this, where it has become more and more messy because they've focused more and more of the story's mm -hmm. point or exploration on the time travel itself. And it never makes any sense, and it always creates a million plot holes, and you're, you're taking emphasis off of the things we really care about, which are the characters and, and sure. some of the human relatable themes and you're putting it onto something, uh, an abstract concept that yeah. we can't wrap our hands or heads around, right? Did you got something you were gonna say? I did, when you make your story about time travel, you essentially, e you, it's not that you erase your story, but maybe you set your story up to be erased later by time travel. Um, you know, the story, whatever happens in your story can easily be undone by time travel, right? Mm -hmm. And so the story kind of just, you can't, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Whereas if you have um, constraints or, you know, like like Chrono Trigger, like the way that they do it, it's not just something that, you know, anyone can always do at any time. It's There's a specific like thing that time travels you and to specific places <laughs> and it's not, it's not like, you it's know. It's not totally open. Let's, yeah, it's not totally there's open. There's some limitations there. Mm -hmm. He actually gets into that and it's mm -hmm. something that I really agreed with. This is one of um, Brandon Sanderson, author of uh, Mistborn, The Stormlight Archive. It's one of his yeah. guiding principles for creating magic systems is don't think about all the things you can do mm. with magic. Think about all the things you cannot do. Yeah. Create limitations Because that's the conflict it, of right? your, yeah. That's what will take a resolution mm. from feeling like a deus ex machina to feeling like, oh, they're really clever. They mm. worked around the rule and they found right. a way to make it work. They stayed within the boundaries of it, but they found a way, you know, they were clever and they found a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, so he talks about making it a framing device and that the more you open it up, the more um, ambiguous or, or, or the more that you, you take the limitations off of it, the, the more difficult it is to accept, the less believable it mm. becomes. He talks about the difference between realism and believability, that we're not going necessarily for realism, we're just trying to make it believable. A lot of good stuff in here, right? Mm. Um, but again, um, just a couple of things in particular that I wanted to focus on. Uh, if for whatever reason you do want to write a story which involves time travel, the best advice I can give you is this. Do not focus on it more than is absolutely necessary. Remember time travel is just a framework which only exists to set the stakes. It is in your best interest to not focus on that framework any more than you need to. Doing so is the writer's equivalent of trying to escape from quicksand. The harder you try, the faster you'll sink and the story with you. 
And that's, that's true. That is absolutely you, true. You can get so focused, yeah. and I, I've caught myself doing this too, mm -hmm. so focused on the minutia, so focused on trying to plug in all the holes mm -hmm. that you you create new ones. Right. And you just like, oh, and you start sinking <laughs> more, and it's like, crap, and you try to fill those up, and then that just creates more problems, right. and it just like spins out of control. It's almost like don't, don't explain how time travel works necessarily. Yeah. Because people are going to figure out, well, it could have worked here, it could have worked here, it could have worked here. Just have it be a thing that happens yeah. because of some mysterious crystal that you got, and that's that. <laughs> yeah. Or if you do explain it, have it with some very basic rules, and only very right. few. Mm. Um, in Chrono Trigger's case, one of the reasons why Chrono Trigger works is because of the concept of time traveler's immunity. Right? Mm. It's a rule. That means that if I go back and change something in the past, it cannot change my right. previous experience that led to my birth or a whatever. A rule, yeah, yeah. Right? Which is why the, the moment where uh, Luca dis describes the grandfather paradox oh, yeah. does not belong <laughs> in, in Chrono Trigger because the it, doesn't rule, make sense. it goes against the rules. Yeah, but it goes against their own rules, yeah. From what I've read, Sakaguchi loves the concept of the, the grandfather's paradox okay, sure. and was like, put that in there. Mm -hmm. But the guy was like, that's against the whole rules of the freaking story. <laughs> so like, it doesn't work, right? That's funny. Anyways, yeah. but it, so that's the one part of Chrono Trigger that feels totally out of place mm -hmm. because... She's explaining this rule that doesn't actually apply right. to Chrono Trigger's time travel concept. Um, okay, so this is where he gets to um, Final Fantasy VII Remake. And there's, there's one thing that he wrote that I, it's not that I disagree, but that I'm just not sure mm -hmm. that I totally agree with yet. And then there's another part of it that I really, really, really agreed with. And so the, just a couple things I want to read here. Let me find it here. The problem with Final Fantasy VII Remake is that it literally shoehorns multiverse theory into its plot for no other reason than to have a surprise plot twist at the end. In doing so, however, the game ends up drawing attention to all of the story, um, to all that, wait, wait, drawing attention to all of that in the story which does not make sense. In general, plot twists which involve multiverse theory almost never work because they're inherently, they inherently recontextualize the entire story in a way that breaks the audience's immersion and often leaves them more confused than impressed. Um, so here's the, the one thing about that that I would mm -hmm. use as a counterpoint. Final Fantasy VII Remake doesn't actually explain much at all Oh, really? and, and, and we don't even really know, we can, we can assume, we can mm. make very logical assumptions that this is multiverse that's happening here. Okay. Or that there's time travel involved with Sephiroth or whatever. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you see it, you, you kind of read between the lines, but they don't actually spend any time dialogue wise or in the, in the, in the text of the story explaining the huh. rules of this. It just kind of mm. opens it up at the end with all of these mysteries and it means that they could take it one of a million ways really. Right. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of thing, a lot of what you'll see counter points to the criticisms. It's like you don't actually know that it's this or whatever. Just wait and see what they do with it. <laughs> I don't trust them right. as storytellers, so I'm not going to give the next game a chance personally. Mm -hmm. But they didn't focus, I think, on the, the mechanics of time travel or multiverse in Final Fantasy VII Remake that they do in maybe some of the other things, like maybe the, the Terminator uh, storyline, which right. eventually I think they try, to, they try to set it up to where, it, which is I think the most logical of all time travel premises mm -hmm. is that anything that you go back and change, it, 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 you can't change the future because your future self will ha would have made these changes. So it's like a loop, right? Yeah. Like that can't be broken because right. anything that had been, that happens in the future is the result of the change that you made when you time traveled, right? Mm -hmm. That to me seems like the most plausible, and he agrees, the most plausible sure. result of time travel. Yeah. Okay, anyways. Um, it talks about the original here. Um, worst of all though, there don't seem to be any rules for how the multiverse theory uh, shenanigans will play out in future installments. This in turn robs all sense of immersion or tension because the audience has no reassurance that the writers will not start pulling insane contrivances and deus ex machinas out of thin air. You cannot write a good fantasy story, or indeed any story, if all you are doing is just making it up as you go along. 
Now, we don't know for sure if they don't have a plan or not, but the idea of opening it up so wide mm -hmm. rather than like focusing it more, um, I, I do think, and he, he makes a really great point about that in a second, and, and this is what I really, really agreed with. When writing time travel into your story, the key is to provide a short list of basic rules. I think I said that already. Um, do not at any point change the rules that you've already laid for yourself. If you do, the story will uh, ever only end up devolving into an ir irreparably convoluted disaster like what Terminator has become. Um, the key to creating an intense story with high stakes is, the, is to trap characters in situations wherein they have limited time and limited options. So he's talking about stakes again. Sorry, it's, it's long. I'm trying to remember which paragraph it was. Uh, they easily destroy the stay. Okay. If anything and everything in a story can be theoretically altered with absolutely no in-universe constraints whatsoever, bound only to the whims of the writers themselves, then why does anything that happens in the story matter? Yeah, yep. And this is kind of what I'm trying to get at with, when you open it up so much and there's, when, when anything can be changed, mm -hmm. you know? Um, when, this is kind of the problem when, when uh, you bring characters back from the dead and there's no consequences <laughs> yeah, yeah. anymore, right? Then it's like, oh, the writers decided. It's there like, were no rules to this, it's just the writers decided. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, and I'll yeah. read that again because that really struck at, stuck to me as, as being profound. If anything and anything in a story can theoretically be altered with absolutely no universe constraints, there's no constraints, there's no rules, right? And, and with multiverse theory and time travel, all you're doing is opening up the possibilities of what you can alter or mm -hmm. change. Yeah, there's, yeah. You're, you're, you're eliminating the rules, mm -hmm. right? Uh, no universe constraints whatsoever, bound only to the whims of the writers themselves, then why does anything that happens in the story matter? Because you could come up with some reason mm. why they could just change this now. Or if something bad happens, they can just change that. Or if this happens, okay, we can just go back and change this. Mm -hmm. And it, it's an endless cycle of there's no rules, there's no boundaries, there's no constraints, there's no limits. And so there's no consequence. Right. And that is... Without consequence, you can't have a story. That, <laughs> you can't have a, yeah. what's the word, conflict or anything. Conflict. Yeah. Conflict is the center of what makes anything in life interesting. Or yes. <laughs> and this is what we're talking Even about. Even if you have to create the conflict yourself. Yes. That's what makes things interesting. Exactly. Yeah. If you are, if there's no conflict, if there's no consequence, if you could just, there's no limits on what you could do. Mm. It's boring. Yeah. And... Like the con like the, the, the thing we just talked about, the, the topic right before this, you know, at a certain point, you just can't keep doing it anymore. Right. It's not until you and feel limited. And even stories like you're on season 10 of a time travel show, like Doctor Who, <laughs> <laughs> which I've never actually seen before. It, I've heard it's a very good show. Um, but yeah, at some point, um, maybe it just gets boring. Yeah. And, I, and like, you know, when, when things are happening to us, conflict happens to us in real life, it's mm -hmm. uncomfortable, it sucks, you're afraid, you know, you don't know whether you're gonna make it through, the consequences are on your mind, and right. it sucks. Yet, that, it's entertaining when it's happening to someone else. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and you're <laughs> yeah. empathizing with them, which is yeah. why storytelling is full of conflict. Mm -hmm. And there is something, I think, really true here, that the, that time travel, multiverse theory, these ways that they try to extend a franchise and keep it running, and the way that they open the boundaries and remove the limitations, mm -hmm. uh, the less conflict it feels like it has, the less right. it feels like anything matters, and the more boring it becomes, ultimately, sure. as a result. So, I have one more question for you. Sure. So sorry to knock Doctor Who for anybody listening. I know it's a very popular show. Many people like it, and they do a good job creating conflict, in my understanding. But have you seen Doctor Strange? Yes. Okay. In terms of the way, now I have not seen Doctor Strange, but I understand the concept. I understand like what he is and what he's doing. What do you think of what do you think of Doctor Strange in light of in light of this? Of his ability, multiverse theory wise, to my, my understanding is that he picks the right universe in which he did the right thing. Let me, let me tell you, this, <laughs> this is actually a perfect answer. Let's hear it. Spoilers for Doctor Strange. 
Sorry, people. you're not going to watch that. Sorry. But literally, I'm very the, the, about literally this. the way he defeats the villain yeah. in that story is he makes him bored of the loop, of the oh repetition. Oh my gosh, really? And the guy gives up. Holy cow. The villain gives up because he's sick of the repetition of the time loop. Wow. It That's goes on actually really cool. <laughs> so long That's that he's really like, cool. I can't take anymore, I give up. That is wow. literally how Doctor Strange defeats the villain in that Because I was going to say, if there was no universe in which he was capable of defeating this person, yeah. then then how does he do the it? The villain and just gets sick. He takes he, the universe that they, he tried to do it yeah. over and over and you, over. And it's it actually a very funny that scene because crazy. Doctor Strange just keeps coming back, keeps coming back, yeah. keeps coming back, and he keeps beating him, he keeps defeating him, he keeps defeating him. Yeah. And eventually he just like, I can't, I can't take it anymore. The repetition... I, it, that is literally wow. how he defeats that the That is fascinating. That and kind it's of really clever. Because that plays into exactly what we're talking <laughs> yes. about. It's very clever, and it actually, it, it doesn't fix a problem, but it uses the problem, our understanding of the problem, as its own climax of yeah. the and its own resolution of yeah. the story. That's fascinating. And that's why it's one of my favorite Marvel movies. I should Marvel watch movies. the movie now. Everyone says that. It's really good. Maybe I'll watch it in Spanish. I really like it. <laughs> And yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm not a big superhero guy. You know that. Yeah. Like, I, I tend to not like these types of stories. I think I find right. them very repetitious. They are all kind of the same. But that one, that movie was really well done. Hmm. I really liked it. It's one of my favorite Marvel movies. So, well, cool. All right, guys, that is the end of today's podcast. We thank you for joining us. We thank you for your support, for for watching, and uh, we got videos coming out. Yes, my. Lost Odyssey retrospective is getting pretty close to 50 minutes long. It's the longest one I've ever done. So hopefully there'll be some good info in there that you guys like. Kason's got his video. Again, hit him up with your thoughts on the topic. Yeah, let me know so how, it's, how it's affected you. Refine it and, and get some other ideas. We love to hear yeah. from you guys. So until next time, thanks everyone. Peace out and stay safe. Peace.